This morning we're going to end our Christmas series because next Sunday Christmas will have been passed, right? But it's not here yet. Thank you, Caroline. Just in case I get worked up and <laughs> I forgot my my little rags. So <laughs> isn't it neat that we can be open with one another, just be ourselves. Praise God. But I'm looking forward to this season, this Christmas. We forgot to tell you how many of you are planning to come to a prayer meeting and Grace and her sisters Wednesday night. <laughs> That's what I thought. Just in case I had some of you hardcore prayer warriors, we've canceled Wednesday night, okay? All Wednesday night services. But I'd like to do something different this year in our family. I hope when we gather, I'm going to uh, ask the family to take the uh, time to come together Christmas evening and just pray with one another. Praise the Lord. Thank God for what he's done. Keep us focused on him that, that day and to pray for the new year to come. So I encourage you in your homes, if you don't already do that, maybe you get together and have a small little prayer meeting right there in your home, praising God. Amen? But last week we looked at the visit of the Magi to Bethlehem where we said it was we saw his star. We were, we were reminded how much more we should, those of us who know so much more, worship him and adore him this Christmas. How much more our hearts should be overflowing with exceedingly great joy. Don't you love how those words are put together just for the emphasis? Exceedingly great, as if great wouldn't be enough. I hope this last week that is exactly what you've been doing as you follow Jesus throughout your day as you fellowship with Jesus throughout your day, as you loved him and proclaimed him. I trust and pray that's been what's going on in your life. Today we're going to look at the visit of the shepherds to Bethlehem. We heard the good news. How many of you can say, thank God I've heard the good news? You know, there are only two visits made to Bethlehem at the birth of Jesus before Joseph and Mary moved back to Nazareth. So, read with me the text. 20 verses, and we're going to go through them. Luke 2, 1 through 20. We can never hear this enough. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And they gave birth to her firstborn son. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone all around them. And they were terribly frightened. I don't blame them. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Hey, let's go straight to Bethlehem then, and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry. And found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. 
when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as they had been told. Amen? Amen. Praise God for the, this account. Praise God for this story. Christmas time, how many of you use Amazon? You know, Shannon and I, I kind of like how our roles are, uh, have just kind of morphed into their roles without any uh, discussion. I buy, I get told what to get, I click, 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 and she does all the wrapping. It's kind of a fair trade, in my opinion. <laughs> I haven't been in a store to buy a gift in years. Amazon, though, is featuring a debut picture book by Nancy Tillman titled On the Night You Were Born. A New York Times and Publishers weekly best-selling book that has touched the hearts of readers of all ages, says Amazon. Here's some of the book. On the night you were born, the moon smiled with such wonder that the stars peeked in to see you. And the night wind whispered, life will never be the same. On the night you were born, the whole world came alive with thanksgiving. The moon stayed up till morning because there had never been anyone like you ever in the world. So enchanted with you were the wind and the rain that they whispered the sound of your wonderful name. The sound of your name is a magical one. Let's say it aloud before we go on. Aaron! 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 Amazon said of the book, On the night you were born, you brought wonder and magic to the whole world. Here is a book that celebrates you. Wow. I say, here is a book that doesn't celebrate Jesus, but celebrates you. You know, in a world that loves to celebrate self, we must remember that we're here to celebrate what caused the very angels to sing. I know that on the night Jesus was born, all the angels in heaven sing with joy at the sound of his wonderful name, not the sound of my wonderful name. And I know that because of that night on which Jesus was born, my life has never been the same. Amen. I hope we all can say the same. This morning we are here to celebrate the good news of great joy announced by the angels on the night that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was born. We're here to celebrate His wonderful name. And we should celebrate that each and every day of our life. Amen? And that wonderful name can be summarized in three words. Three words the shepherds heard on that night when they heard this very good news that Jesus had been born. In verse 11, for today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Dear Lord, we come to you as the Savior, the Christ, the Lord. And we thank you that on this day that we are here to celebrate your coming on this earth, taking on man and doing what we could never do. Lord, it is your name and your own, your name only worthy to be praised. And may we praise you from our hearts, our minds, from the very depths of our soul. We give you glory. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. So in Luke 2, 11 through 12, the angel here is probably Gabriel, the very angel who came to Mary in chapter 126 that we read in our scripture reading. He first told them the place of the Savior's birth. He said, the city of David. And then he mentioned the condition that they were going to find him in. He'd be wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Those of you who grew up in Sunday school 30, 40 years ago, we knew them as what type of clothes? Swaddling clothes. Verses 1 through 6 then gives us the details. 
So the historical situation that caused Jesus to be born in Bethlehem, even though G, uh, G, uh, Joseph and Mary lived in Nazareth way up north at the time, was the census ordered by Caesar Augustus for which everyone had to register in his own city. Everybody had to be counted. Let's go a little closer. So Joseph, being a descendant of David, we saw this as from the tribe of Judah, he returned with Mary to the town of Bethlehem. Remember this town that wasn't even listed in the towns. However, in the bigger picture, we must see it was not Caesar ordering these events. Some of this can seem so common to us that we get so used to it. But Caesar, and all his power and his worldly power, it wasn't him. It was God himself orchestrating every detail in accordance with his divine plan found in the word of God. Amen? Caesar was but one of God's human instruments to fulfill what God had already decreed, already determined would happen when he told us in his prophet 700 years earlier in Micah. It was God who was carrying out his very word. God carrying out his very plan. The plan that the place of our Lord's birth being Bethlehem as he saw last week. And God was going to get them to Bethlehem. And the condition they found him in, a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. This was also by God's great divine plan. Jesus was not born in a palace, was he? Not even in the home of friends, nor in the relative comfort of an inn or a hotel room. He was born in a stable, in the place where animals were kept, and he had for his cradle a manger that is a feeding trough for animals. I liked, uh, well, I'm not there yet. Ama- amazing. He's born in a manger. Luke 9.58 tells us Jesus would one day say that the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus humbled himself to the lowest, to the very lowest, So everything pointed to the Father. He came for all of humanity. Praise God for that as he emptied himself to the lowest. However, aren't you thankful we never hear Jesus complain? We never hear him complain. He was not wishing he had more of this world's goods. He was not wishing he had a better lifestyle. He was not jealous or envious of others. Jesus lived from the cradle to the grave, detached from the material things and the outward trappings that so many people in the world think are so important. The things that are essential to life, our wants and our desires. But Jesus taught something in the way he lived. He would teach and model in his very life, beginning right at his birth, that real life is not wrapped up in essentials. It's not wrapped up in worldly riches. That real life is wrapped up in true riches that do not consist of the things of this world, but consist in the salvation that he is here to offer. That he came into this world to give to those who would believe in him. Praise God for that. Sadly, this account in Luke has far often been rewritten. Too many homes today look like this. Let me read to you a satire that was written in the Bethesda Christian News time somewhere back in the early 80s. It goes like this. And there were in the same country children keeping watch over their stockings by the fireplace. And slow Santa Claus came upon them And they were sore afraid. And Santa said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all the people who can afford them. 
For unto you will be given great feasts of turkey, dressing, pies, and many presents. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the presents wrapped in the bright paper lying beneath the tree, adorned with tinsel, colored balls, and lights. And suddenly there will be with you a multitude of relatives and friends praising you and saying, Thanks so much. It was just what I wanted. And it shall come to pass, as the friends and relatives have gone away into their own homes, parents shall say to one another, What a mess to clean up. I'm tired. Let's go to bed and pick it up tomorrow. Thank goodness Christmas only comes once a year. Huh. Does this sound familiar? The sad part of it is that a majority of homes will celebrate Christmas just like this. Traveling elves, Santa Claus, and all this, perpetrating lies to our children. Planting seeds that are satanic against Almighty God, the baby who came into this world to be the Son of God, the gift of life. So many. It's one of the greatest lies perpetrated by Satan. Many are so upset and disappointed that they don't receive the material possessions they wanted at Christmas. I remember a story. I may have told you this, but it's just embedded in my mind about Claire. One Christmas, she's just a little girl. She's just a toddler. We're at my mom and dad's for Christmas morning. And the other two girls, and I think even Hannah and Leah maybe at this point, had all opened up a gift and had baby dolls at some special store. My mom got them in Chicago. Unfortunately, my mom thought her next gift was the baby doll. But have you ever made a mistake in there? You got another gift there. Claire opened it up, and it was something that had nothing to do with baby dolls. And she opened it, and she said, I will not have it, and took that gift and threw it down. Because she wanted her baby doll. Wow. <laughs> it was a shock to me, but it was a real lesson about the heart of man from a little toddler. Many even believers can feel like it's a bad Christmas when there's not enough money to buy all the toys and the things they want. Have you ever felt like, oh, I can't give enough. Oh, my children aren't going to have this. Many feel this overwhelming burden on them from society. But I want us to know today, to be reminded today, that no matter where you are at in life, that if you have the gift of Christmas, if you have eternal life in Jesus, you can rejoice with the greatest joy, exceedingly rejoice about your condition in Christ. Because Christmas is Jesus. Christmas is Jesus Christ. We must focus on that in Christmas. Amen? Praise God. So let's look at that wonderful name the shepherds heard when they heard the good news that Jesus had been born. And let's just take a brief moment to overview what that means. There is no way in the time allotted this morning we could cover all of it. At the birth of Jesus, the Savior, we're told, came into the world. This is the first and the foremost this is the culmination of everything in the Bible up to this point. God's mercy, God's grace, God's love. Culmination given now to man in the form and the Son of Jesus Christ. We must keep in mind who's speaking here. Who's speaking? An angel from heaven. I guess if an angel from heaven is speaking, he comes on good authority. Right? But he's more, but more than an angel, those shepherds, they knew that what they heard from the angel was a message from the Lord. Because in verse 15, the angel told him whose authority he speaks on. The Lord has made known to us, they said. They knew who was talking to them. In heaven's estimate, in the estimate of the, the Lord of heaven and all of God's word, the world is in need of something. The world is needs a Savior. The very reason in which Jesus, and why he came into the world. It's the purpose for which Jesus came into this world 
was to save us. It was to reconcile us, to reunite us to God the Father where sin separated us. It was the reason he was born. Tis the season, tis the reason. Tis the season to be jolly. Fa la 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 la. Oh, I'm jolly. Fa la 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 la. Tis the season to be jolly. Why are you jolly? For all the right reasons, because a Savior has been born. That's tis the reason for the season. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15 We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. 1 John 4.14 In Matthew 1.21 the angel told this to Joseph You shall call his name Jesus which means Jehovah is salvation for he will save his people from their sins. Wow, the Savior. If we miss this about Christmas, we've missed everything. The Bible says what? That we have all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. That there is none righteous, not even one. And that the payment for our sins is to perish eternally in a place called hell apart from the light of heaven, apart from Jesus Christ. But God did something, and it came from his great love. It came right out of his heart of love when he sent Jesus Christ into the world to be the Savior for us. Amen? To pay the penalties for our sins on Calvary. That we, by putting our faith in him as our sin substitute, might be given the very greatest gift of all mankind, eternal life, in Jesus Christ the Lord. There is no greater gift. There is no greater gift you can receive. It's handed right there for all of man. They just must receive it. God gave us the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice. Jesus came from the cradle to Bethlehem that he might go to the cross from Calvary. And he wrote that check, pay to the order of God the Father. The amount and the amount of Jesus Christ sacrificed in his life. How? Through the shedding of his blood on the cross, the reason to atone for mankind's sin, signed Jesus Christ, stamped by God, paid in full. We don't have the ability to write a check like that. Only God can. Only Jesus can. Does that make you happy? If we could somehow save ourselves by being good enough to make up for our sins, if we could somehow pay for our sins, what would be the need of Almighty God emptying Himself, humbling Himself, coming down as man, and go through the crucifixion on our behalf? There would be no need. God would say, step up, stand up, and pay up. But he sent us a Savior. Thank God he did, amen? Verse 10, that is the good news of great joy. The good news of great joy. That is what we celebrate at Christmas. Praise God. Second, this next name at the birth of Jesus, the Christ came into the world. The Christ came into the world. This name Christ is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Messiah, meaning God's anointed. God's anointed one is here. Wow. He is the Messiah or the anointed one long hoped for that will establish the kingdom of Israel in the coming millennium, which hasn't arrived yet. Remember, as we saw last week, the Messiah was the long-hoped-for king of Israel that was going to establish his kingdom now. Little did they know that God still had a timetable yet to come. 
It doesn't take me long to move from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Let's have a Bible quiz. Find that in your books. How long does it take you to get from old to new? A turn of a page? Right there. Yet between these two testaments that our fingers move through so quickly is 400 years of utter silence from God. What did you say, Pastor Tom? 400 years of not hearing from God. How many more years, Lord? 400 years. Almost twice as long as America herself has been in existence. Think of how long 400 years is. And during these centuries, the nation of Israel, they suffered under one political power after another. From the Persia, the medial, the uh, medial Persian Empire, then came the Grecian Empire, and at the present of this time, they were shaping under the heel of Rome. And the hope of a king, the hope of a Messiah, is dwindling away. It's grown dim. Others had given up hope altogether. But then came this angelic announcement to those shepherds, today there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The very day Jesus was born, the angel was sent to the shepherds to announce this good news of great joy. And after thousands of years of prophecies of the coming Messiah Christ, after 400 years, four centuries of total silence, came probably one of the greatest words they ever heard. Today! Today! He has come. That word today takes on a greater significance, does it not? Galatians 4.4, 4, But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son, born of the woman. In the fullness of whose time? God's time. That is the time set by God. God sent his son, born of a virgin. What a revelation and comfort this is to us. The, this Christmas, we are living in a world of chaos. How many of you know this? Terrorism around us, the fear of nuclear war. In fact, Bloomberg News headline said, U.S. seeks Christmas peace with North Korea as deadline looms. Political unrest, impeachments, and so forth, and anger and dissension. Racism, bigotry, all of the sins of this world flowing over. This is the day we live in. But let me tell you, God is in control. God has everything under his control. He is not in heaven wringing his hands over what is happening down here. Everything is going according to his plan and his timing. Did you know that with the birth of Jesus Christ, the last days and the clock of God's timetable for the world were ushered in? At the birth of Jesus Christ, we immediately are in the last days. Hebrews 1, 1 through 2, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. You and I live in these momentous days. Jesus himself has told us that he is coming again, praise God. Not in a cradle, but he's coming on the clouds of glory at a time fixed by the Father, Matthew 26, 24, Acts 1, 7 through 8. He's coming again on the clouds at a fixed time. Soon and very soon we shall see 
the king. Amen. There is a coming, a today, and that day could be today. One of us, or all of us, whether it's the rapture or what, today will be the day. Today unto you. The Messiah will return and fulfill his promises, and he will set up his kingdom. God said so. It will happen. And these last days started in that manger. And we are left here to do his work until he returns, which in God's timing could be at any moment. Are you excited about that? To think at any moment Jesus could come for us? Today, I love that word. What a comfort for us to know this. How many of you know in our personal lives that God is always on time? Do you know that God is never late? That is, on his time. God is always on his time. We may get discouraged. We can often become uh, downcast. And we often do because he does not respond to our timetable. He does not answer our prayers the way we wish he would. He does not move according to the speed we want. But Christmas reminds us that his timetable is always the best, and waiting on him is always worth the wait. Do you know that waiting on the Lord is always worth the wait? So first we see at the birth of Jesus, the Savior came into the world. At the birth of Jesus, the Christ came into the world. Lastly, at the birth of Jesus, the Lord came into the world. This word Lord here, used in this context by an angel from heaven, is not a term of respect. It's not just a term of respect. Lord is the word used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament to translate a word Named Jehovah. God who has all power and authority. In John 1, 20, 22, and 23, do you remember when John the Baptist was asked who he was? John the Baptist, who are you? He declared that he was not the Christ, that he was not the Messiah. He said of himself that he was the one spoken of in Isaiah 40 who would make straight the way of the Lord referring to Jesus Christ. So who is this Lord? What does Isaiah 40 tell us? Verse 3, Clear the way for the Lord, all cats. Translating the Hebrew for Jehovah, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God, which is Elohim. This is God. John the Baptist was clearing the way for the Lord God of the Old Testament, Elohim, Jehovah, the Lord, God Almighty. Wow, right? Praise God. No wonder John the Baptist said of Jesus, though Jesus was six months older than John the Baptist, said, He existed before me. John 6.30 in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1, 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Incredible. This is deity taking on humanity. The Word is Jesus, the everlasting from everlasting. Does that excite you? He became flesh for you, for me, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Philippians 2, 6-7. Praise you, Lord. No one had ever seen God, but here God has shown himself through Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. 
Let's give the Lord a round of applause. In that cradle, man, God came into our world that he might redeem me, that he might redeem you, that he would redeem us and take whoever, whosoever would believe in him to his world above to live with him for all eternity. What greater love could there be? When we truly understand the magnitude of sin, when we truly understand how we sinned against the almighty God, what greater love could there be? Today there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Isn't it amazing how you look at these three names? Should we not sing and celebrate his wonderful name? Amen. Praise God. Nancy Tillman, remember what she said in her book, that on the night you were born, the whole world came alive with thanksgiving. Huh? No. Should our hearts not come alive with thanksgiving this Christmas for the night Jesus Christ was born. Praise team. Come forward. Praise team. What's it say? Glory to God. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest of the angels and the shepherds. To think that he who created the world and all the angels who sang at his birth should leave his realm should leave his realm of glory to one day die on a cruel, cruel, cruel cross to redeem such a sinner as me. To redeem me. To redeem us. Everyone, please stand. And say with me like the angels. And say it like you mean it. Say it like you mean it. We're going to say glory to God. Glory to God. Merry Christmas. Let's say it. Let's shout it out. Glory to God. Glory to God. Merry Christmas. Do you believe it? Glory to Almighty God. There is a Redeemer. Let's thank Him. Let's praise Him. Let's give Him our gratitude. Please sing.